Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory, glory to God. We're going to do um, another prayer, and then we'll do our confessions for the word of God. Let's bow our heads. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our givers, God. Thank you for those who are tuned in online. We appreciate them. God, we ask that you would strengthen us in every way possible. I'm asking that you would hide me beneath the cross, that you would think through my mind, speak through my mouth, God, and let it be all of you and less of me, and let the people be eternally touched and blessed. And God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name, and let all the people say, amen. We appreciate you. All right, with your Bibles in your hands, or your phones, or whatever. I say if you got it all in your head, grab your head, whatever you, you connect to the word of God with. Repeat after me, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I will have what it says I will have. I'm a part of Deliverance Temple where we love by living our vision every day. We connect with our creator continually. We confess our deliverance consistently. We commit to serve creatively. We communicate Christ's love compassionately. Pastor Andre, feed me this word. Come on, put your hands together again this morning. Amen. And always good to have the participation from the pews, especially for being here, just me and my boys the last few weeks. So uh, we, we ended up in a series called Don't Lose. I didn't know it was a series until... Uh, my wife preached the first message and then God began to give me subsequent messages based on that. So the first one was, and as they put it up, I'll just have you repeat it after me as uh, they put it up on the screen. The first one was, don't lose focus. Say that. Don't lose focus. Amen. Uh, uh, my, my wife began to preach on the point of how we have to remain and keep our focus. I believe that was a very prophetic word. And so that moved me then when I spoke that next Sunday, this was what we talked about, and they will flash that one up there. And repeat that, don't lose your fight. Don't lose your fight. So don't lose your focus and don't lose your fight. All right, and then last week, and they will show us this one, don't lose your footing. So this has been the Don't Lose series. Don't lose your focus, don't lose your fight, and don't lose your footing or your balance. All right, so today we're going to go to Luke 3 and 15. This is where we are going to start. It says, as the people were in expectation, that's, that's beautiful and powerful, that what we don't often understand is that people bring expectation. Many of you can stay home because we offer online, but it's something about when you come in the building, it raises the level of expectation. Somebody say expectation. expectation. All right, going back to the verse, Luke 3, 15, as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, meaning John the Baptist, whether he might be the Christ, is he the Messiah or the anointed one? And then transitioning to verse 16, the answer comes, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water because John was baptizing them, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He said, I can't even tie his shoelaces. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That brings me to, to today's lesson. And it's simply this, don't lose your fire. Say that with me. Don't lose your fire. So don't lose your focus. Don't lose your fight. Don't lose your footing. And finally, don't lose your fire. And what that means is don't lose your passion. The, the scripture says in Revelation that the goal of Satan is to wear out the patience of the saints. In other words, to have us going through so many things, so many disappointments, so many ups and downs, so many trials, 
that we just get so weary, we quit. We, we, we know that we're taught in the end we're going to win, but the journey can be so hard and so harsh that we lose our fire. But the, this is what I've come to understand. Everybody's going through something. Whether you are a believer or a non-believer, you're going through the stress and the strain of life. And what I've made up in my mind, I might as well go through hell with God than go through hell without. I, I don't really talk about people who are addicted to dope and addicted to alcohol because they don't have anything else to turn to. I've got something and someone to turn to, so I don't want to let my fire go out. Or I can say it like we were taught in Sunday school. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I don't want my light to go out. I don't want my fire to go out. I don't want my candle to burn dim. I, I still want to have the same joy I had when I first got saved. I know I've been through some trials. I know I've been through some pressure. I know I've been through some strain. But I don't want to lose my focus. I don't want to lose my will to fight. I don't want to lose my footing and my balance, and I don't want to lose my fire. So having said that, let's, let's look at what fire means. And we're not going to talk about the normal expectation of fire. So here, here are three definitions. Here, the first one is the normal combustion or burning. Anything that is combustion or burning, it comes from a source called fire. But number two says this. A burning sensation in the body. Have you, you, you ever been or, or had a fever and it just felt like my head is on fire, my, my hands are on fire? It's not a literal fire, but it's something internally raising your temperature and it feels like your body is on fire. And what I'm saying is spiritually, it ought to be something raging on the inside of us. Sometimes on the outside, we look like normal, regular people, but on the inside, there's something still raging and burning on the inside of me. The Bible says the outer man wastes away, but the inner man is renewed day by day by day. I still got my fire. I still got my hope. I still have my joy. They used to say it this way. This joy that I have the world didn't give it to me. And since the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. I still have a burning inside in me that I want to live this thing out. I want to walk this thing out. I want to make it to heaven. I don't want to give up on God now. I, I don't want to quit now. I don't want to lose my focus. I don't want to lose my fight. I don't want to lose my footing. And I sure don't want to lose my fire. Let's bring the third definition up. This is how I, I want to transition Fervent or passionate emotion or enthusiasm. Fervent, hot, or passionate emotion or enthusiasm. Now, now I, I want to explain that a little bit, and this ain't for nobody in the building. This is just for the folk in TV land, so to speak, because I know y'all ain't never dealt with that, this, but, but, but if you ever been tempted by the opposite sex, there's something that happens on the inside. The teenagers are calling you get butterflies in your stomach. And, uh, and, and it's amazing how you can talk on the phone all night long to the one that you love. Don't be talking about nothing. All you're doing is listen to each other breathe, but you're just holding the phone. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, baby, you hang up. No, because it's something in the initial stages of love is fervent. It's passionate. It's enthusiastic. And when, when, when I was dating Devin, we were still young, and we were over in that other church. When she would step in the door, my heart would skip a beat. Now I can be right next to her, and my heart don't do nothing because we've been in this thing a while. It's not about the emotions now. It's about the love. But when it comes to God, does God still burn? 
burn your passion? Or are you still enthusiastic about God? And, and, and I don't want to talk about anybody because y'all here, but I, I do wonder because we were reopening the building after not being here for the first three weeks of September, and I just wonder would anybody be enthusiastic enough to come to the house of God? I know you can get it online, but is anybody burning saying, I got to get in the building and be around my people. I, 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 there's some stuff I just can't catch online. That I got a fire down on the inside of me, and I got to get around some other fiery folk. You know, when there are forest fires, the problem is that the forest fire usually starts small. But other things begin to catch a blaze. They begin to catch something next to my blaze. I want to be so on fire that if you sit on my row, you get on fire like I get on fire. If, if I run into you in the grocery store or at the gym, you catch the fire that I have. Because there's an enthusiasm in me that because I love my God so much. All right, let's, let's give us some fire synonyms. Not the normal fire synonyms, but the ones related to this part. Fire sending this energy, vigor, animation, creativity, vitality, vibrancy, exuberance, passion, intensity, zeal, spirit. Let me do it again. Energy. I want energy for God. I want my vigor for God to be strong. I want to be animated for God. I know you can have quiet and cute church, but I don't want quiet and cute church. I like to get loud in church. I, I like to stick my hands in there. I like to stomp my feet. I like to shake my head. I'm not mad at you because you go to mass and you're quiet. You do the way you want to do it. But for me... And my house, I, I just can't keep quiet. He's been too good to me. Yeah, I know my daddy's in the hospital, but he's still been good to me. And I can't help it. I got a fire down on the inside. And you might see me by myself talking to myself, but I'm not really talking to myself. I'm talking to the God that I serve because I need him on a Sunday, but I still need him on a Monday. And I still need him on a Tuesday. And I still need him on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I need him in January. But but I need them in February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December, and the next year again, because I need my car, and I'm going to be excited for my Savior. Energy, vigor, animation, creativity, vitality, vibrancy, exuberance, passion, intensity, zeal, and spirit. That second to the last one is how we're going to start our very first point. Point A is your zeal. So I talked to you on the other, especially when, when we talked about don't lose your fight. We talked to you about the fact that, that Satan is after your faith. That's the, way, the reason why the fight comes, the fight rages, because he's trying to get our faith and weaken our faith. But in the process, he's trying to weaken and ruin our zeal or our passion. Because it's easy to just go through the motions of church and just, this is the way we go to church, go to church, without any zeal, without any passion, without any vibrancy. So it's about your zeal. But let's look at Jeremiah 20 and 7. And explain it to you this way. It says, oh, Lord, you have deceived me. Now, this is interesting for Jeremiah the prophet to start a scripture this way or in the middle of the scripture. It says, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. I'll, I'll, I'll stop and just paint the picture really quick. And what I would like to say, Brother Tommy, is when you start doing things for God, sometimes it feels like God tricked you because you didn't expect it to go this way. When you say yes to God, you assume everything's going to always go the way you want it to go. But sometimes when you say yes to God, that's when all hell breaks out in your life. And many times, if you're being honest, many times you want to walk away and not say, I, I, I want to turn back what I said. I'll give you an example. I remember someone uh, over in the other building. I remember them standing up and in passion, in vibrancy. They gave a testimony that I want to go all the way with the Lord. I'm not going to let nothing stop me. Within three months, their husband left them. 
couple months or years later that, that the son was in prison. All hell broke out in the life because when you say I'm going with God, something's going to challenge you and something's going to test you and what it'll do, it'll test the fire you have down on the inside of you. If you skate through life easy, that means Satan ain't scared of you but if you got to go through tooth and nail, that means Satan's coming after your zeal. He's coming after your fire and Jeremiah was in a situation where he was the only one one prophesying the right thing. Every other prophet was lying. They weren't right. So Jeremiah was the oddball out. And when he would speak what God would tell him to speak, folk would laugh at him. God at one time had him to walk around naked. I don't know if he was literally naked or just down to his under uh, underwear, but he was out in the city streets compelling people. And they was laughing at him. And Jeremiah was like, this is too hard. God, you tricked me. If I would have known it was this hard, I wouldn't have said yes. So let's look at, at verse 8. So just, you have to know it's not just you that's going through stuff. Some of the great people in the Bible went through things too. Verse 8. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. The problem with Jeremiah, God didn't give him a happy message. He didn't give him a message that everybody liked. God gave him the message that violence is coming. Destruction is coming because they had been sinning and Babylon was coming. It was going to take over the nation of Israel. But didn't nobody want to hear that stuff. So he had an odd message. Let's go back to the verse. Then he says, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. Let, let me be honest. You've gone through some of the stuff you've gone through just because you believe God. If you didn't believe and you wasn't going to be no good and you, you was going to be a cheating man and a cheating wife and you was going to be a pastor that steal from the offering plate, then sometimes life would be easy for you. But when you try to do it right, it gets kind of hard. Some of y'all single women know you can just get a man to warm your bed, but you want a real man. So you go through being lonely. You raise kids by yourself. It would be easier to do what everybody else is doing, but something in you says, I got to do it this way. And when you're right, ready to quit, let's look what the next verse says. Verse 9. Jeremiah said it uh, this way. If I say, I will not mention him. If, if I say, I'm not talking about God anymore or speak anymore in his name, there is in my heart as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. I just can't. That's where we get, the King James says, it's like fire shut up in my bones. When I try to walk away from God, I find myself still telling people, God is a good God. There's times I've got up and preached and said, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And the thing I was going through wasn't good, but it's like fire shut up in my bones. I, I just can't back up off of this. I, I just can't quit. I, I just can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop saying hallelujah. Yes, I may be sick and yes, I may be broke and yes, I may be depressed, but there's something on the inside of me that tells me it won't be like this forever and I get up every day and I say this is the day that the Lord has made. Yes, I'm worried and yes, I'm concerned, but there's a fire inside of me that won't let me quit. I'm too far to quit. I've come too far to throw in the towel. There's something in me that just won't let me let this thing go. I still believe. I'm hurting, but I still believe. I'm broken, but I still believe. I'm crying, but I still believe. And it's not because of me. There's a fire on the inside of me. Satan's coming after that fire. He's trying to blow on your fire. But dumb dodo Satan doesn't know that when you blow on fire, it sometimes gets big. <laughs> and so you try to blow me down. You said, I'll huff and I'll puff, Andre, and I'll blow your house down. I'll huff and I'll puff the liver simple and I'll blow your house down. But when you blew on me, you stirred something in me. I'm ready not to lose my focus. I'm ready not to lose my fight. I'm ready not to lose my footing. And I'm ready not to lose my fire. Amen. Let's, let's, let's move to Psalm 69 and 7. And 
The psalmist says, it's for, it is for your sake that I have borne reproach. That dishonor has covered my face. The reason why I'm going through what I'm going through is because I said I'm going with God. There, there's some of y'all know that when you said for sure you was going with God, folk laughed at you. They talked about you. As long as you was drinking the way they was drinking and doping the way they was doping and sexing the way they was sexing and lying the way they was lying, they liked you. But the moment you try to do better. See, some people, and it's not just black people, but some people are like crabs in a barrel. It's, if you go higher than me, I just got to pull you down. That's why they say they can cook crabs without a top on the pot because when the hot and the heat gets in and they try to escape, the one that's escaping gets pulled back down by the other one. So yeah, because I tried to do good, because I tried to step out on faith and start a business, because I tried to live a celibate life, all this stuff is coming at me and God, it seems like it's your fault I'm going through what I'm going through. So it wasn't just Jeremiah. It was the psalmist here that felt the same thing. But let's look at what verse 8 says. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's son. I, I, I will explain this by what Jesus said when they talked about him at some point in time. They, they said, your, your mothers and your brothers are outside Jesus. Jesus was inside teaching, and he said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? My, 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 my mother and, and father is to do the will of God. And it comes a place in your life where you say, listen, family, I love you, but you can't drag me down. See, I got a fire inside of me, and I'm trying to get a degree. And just because you dropped out in the fourth grade, I, I, I'm glad it worked out for you. But you are not me. I'm going and doing what I believe is for me. And so, so sometimes it means that your closest folk become alien to you. Sometimes the person you sleep in the bed with, your spouse become alien to you because you're going after God. And what your spouse doesn't understand, that if they would just back off of you and trust you, you're going to bring the whole family into another level but right now I can't think like you think I can't talk like you talk because you're pouring water on my fire you trying to put my fire out I got some stuff I got to do for God and if you trust me we all going to get blessed but I can't let you bring me down now yeah it hurts to walk alone it hurts to be a trailblazer blazing a trail but people will walk in your trail for days, we are walking in the trails of the Medgar Evans and the, the Malcolm X's and the Martin Luther King's and the Robert Kennedy's and the John Kennedy's. And yes, all those people got assassinated, but we are walking in the trails that they blaze. Yes, when you get out there, yes, you take arrows and you take shots, but your whole family might get blessed if you keep on pressing. Don't let your fire go out. I'd rather lose relationship with my family for a moment just to get the, through the gates and open the door for my family. All right, let's look at verse 9. And this is the, the explanation why. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. I've taken up the fact that at this moment in my life, my family is God. And if you don't like me because I love God, so be it. If you don't like me because I want to go to church, so be it. And if you're going to talk about me because I'm trying to do this thing the Bible way, so be it. Because one day I've learned, you, you come around. I don't have to come to your level because one day you'll ask to get on my level. So I, I ain't coming down for you. I'm not losing my fire for you. I've learned people that talked about me later on said, Andre, can you pray for me? They used to tell me, you too are radical. You, you're young. You ought to go out and have some fun. You don't understand when I tried to have some fun, I about lost my mind. I almost became addicted to alcohol in 18 months. I was going crazy. I came back home from school because I needed help in my my mind and people are saying you shouldn't have left school you shouldn't have done that but now them same people call me pastor Andre they say I'm so grateful for your word I'm so grateful for your anointing but I had to go through something but I didn't lose my fire they talked about me but I didn't lose my fire they lied on me but I didn't lose my fire they said I was crazy but I didn't lose my fire they said you're marrying the wrong girl and almost 22 years later I'm still with the wrong girl because we didn't lose our fire 
So it's okay. It's okay to go through what we call hell and high water. That, that, that saying means that while I was in the fire, it was hard. So while I was in the fire, I called for the water to save me from the fire. But so much water came, I started drowning in the water. In other words, I'm in a catch 22. But one thing I learned, as long as you can keep your head above water, making a way if you can, temporary. Oh, wait a second. That's good time. My, my fault. Long as you can keep your head above water, God will pull you out. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. Don't you lose your focus. Don't you lose your fight. Don't you lose your footing. Don't you lose your fire because God will pull you out. And you'll have a testimony. Why do we want a testimony without a test? We, we, you're going to have a testimony. All right, let, let, let's look at uh, B, your message. Somebody said that. Say your message. So he's after your zeal, but he's also after your message. What does that mean? I, 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 uh, before I, I read that scripture, I'll go back to what I just said uh, about testimony. We, we, we like to say this. It takes a test to have a testimony, but sometimes it takes mess to have a message. And so we want testimonies without tests. And we want to have a message without the mess. But the mess sometimes is going to come. And you ain't got to look for mess. Mess sometimes starts right in the mirror, right in here. I ain't got to look. You ain't got to cause me mess. I done caused enough mess to myself. That's why I don't really make a big deal about people stabbing me in the back because I've sabotaged my own success enough not to worry about somebody else doing it. I can mess my own life up all by myself. But I've learned that God has turned my tests into testimonies and turned my messes into messages. I, uh, into a message, and, and I bring that up because there, there was a person that I used to uh, uh, pray with years ago. I had, hadn't really talked to them in a long time, but I, I realized that I had not relayed to them what was going on with my father. So I was like, I, I probably should should tell them. And I was like, I don't want to just text them with bad news because I haven't talked to them in a long time. Sometimes the people that are in your life to pray with, it's just seasonal. You don't always stay connected to those people forever. So this is one of those persons that it was seasonal. And I just said, oh, by the way, this is what I'm, I'm going through. I still believe, but I just want you to know what I'm going through. The person responded back to me and said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I wish I would have known early, but I understand we don't communicate like that anymore. But they made the statement and said, but your dad's going to have a testimony. He said, it didn't say if they bring him out, but when your dad comes out, he going to have a testimony. And I thought about, it, yeah, 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 yeah. We're going we to go up in arms when he finally does get a chance to hold the mic and preach again. We, he going to have a testimony. He already has one of when he got healed of rheumatoid arthritis, when they told him he'd be crippled for the rest of his life, and he walking around. He already has it, but sometimes you got to go through things to get a greater, deeper, deeper testimony, and it's about your message. All right, so let's, let's bring Psalms 104.1 up, 104 and 1, and I, I will say this, that when I say this, your message, I'm not just talking about pastors and preachers and people that hold the mic. All of you have some message. The, the, the word preach means to proclaim. We all can proclaim. Not everybody's in the fivefold ministry gift, but all of you have a message. Your life is a message. When you go through hell and come out on the other side, your life is a message. And Satan is after your zeal, is after your message. All right, let's look at this verse. Oh, Lord, my God, you are very great. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. Though, so this psalmist is praising the Lord. The reason why I keep saying psalmist is because David wrote most of the psalms, but he didn't write all of them. So I'm not sure who wrote this one, so I'm saying the psalmist. It could be David, but it, it could be someone else. So Psalms 104 and 2 says this. He's still talking about the greatness and the majesty of God. Covering yourself with a light as with a garment. Stretching out the heavens like a tent. When you see the beautiful heavens, God rolled them out like a tent. He's just, he's just majestic. He's just great. That's why I don't want to lose my fire because I, when I die, I want to see this great one who created this universe and put breath in my body. And just last night, me and, and uh, Dylan and my family, we were actually in Ohio, but me and Dylan 
were together, we were looking up at the stars, and he said that's either the North Star or that's Jupiter because of the season that we're in. So we can look up in the sky and we can see the magnificence of God and how everything's put in order and how the sun rotates around the earth and somehow we don't get burned up. God is majestic. I want to meet that God one day. I, I don't want to quit now. I know. I, I want to know how you flung the morning stars together. I, I want to know how you caused the mountains to come up and how you put life in the deepest parts of the ocean and, and how thunder will crackle through the sky and lightning will part the sky. I got some stuff I want to know. I want to know about the rainbow. I want to know how you put breath in my body and how you created my brain and how my brain tells my, 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 my hands to move and my mouth to talk. There's some stuff I, I can't quit now because I got some rewards over there. Yeah, Yes, I have some rewards here, but nothing can compare to what we'll get over there. And I don't want to die and lose out on God. You ought to be the same way. You ought to make up in your mind when my pastor preaches my funeral, he ain't got to lie about me. He ain't got to get up and say, I hope he makes it, and I hope she makes it. No, no, no. When my pastor preached my funeral, yeah, they're going to cry, but somebody's going to rejoice because I crossed over to the other side because I didn't lose my focus, I didn't lose my fight, I didn't lose my footing, and ultimately, I didn't lose the fire I have inside for God. Let's look at verse 3. Tell him some more greatness about him. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariots. He rides on the wings of the wind. Just talking about the majesty of God. But the next verse takes a turn that you wouldn't expect because all the psalmist is talking about is the greatness of his God. But then this next verse makes a turn and points to his creation. Not the, the normal creation, but his Creation, his living creation, not the animals, but humans. We are the apex of his creation. This scripture talks both about his angels and his human beings. 104 and uh, 4 says this. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. Wait, wait, wait a second. Part of the greatness of the universe is you and I. Because he puts his message on the inside of it. First of all, it's talking about the, the, his messengers, the winds. It's talking about angels because the word angel means messenger. But it talks about his ministers, which means those who serve him. We are flames of fire. And that's why the devil wants to pour water on us. So let me say it. Like I said it when I was young. He's he trying to throw salt in our game. The, de the devil trying to throw salt on our swag. He's he trying to make us quit because he knows we are flames of fire. And what he's afraid of is we're going to burn up all his junk. We're going to burn up all his stuff. We're we going to burn up all the mess he's trying to do in the world. Because when we serve God, we're flames of fire in the earth. And all the things that the devil is trying to do, we burn them up and we tear them down. You ever heard the saying, I'm going into the enemy's camp and I'm taking back everything he stole from me. But I need to let you know we don't even have to go into his camp. Because of our flaming fire, we can burn stuff where we are. I can stand right here and point to Arizona and speak the word and things can happen. I can call stuff to happen in Australia. I can call stuff to happen in Iceland. I got power in me. The Bible says I can pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done and give us this day our daily bread. And the devil doesn't want us to know the power that we have. We are flames of fire. He's made all kinds of great things in the universe, but the greatest thing he ever made was you and I. And he didn't die for the stars. He didn't die for the ocean. He didn't die for the mountains. Because the Bible says that this earth will pass away. We're going to get a brand new earth. This is, this is just borrowed earth. But there's one thing that did, not going to pass away. He said his word won't pass away. And he put his word inside of us. Because the only thing he ever planned on being eternal was him and his human. So that's why the devil hates us so much. Let, let, let's look further. Let's look at De Deuteronomy 9.1. And here's 
Here's the reason why. The scripture says we're created in his image. So Deuteronomy 9.1 says, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven. So the, the message is you're going to face some enemies. You're going to face some giants. You're going to face some trouble. But the reason why I have called you to do this is because of verse 2. And three, verse two says, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, which the sons of the Anakim are the giants, the Anakim and the Nephilim were the giants, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Who can stand before death? Who can stand before depression? Who can stand before cancer? Who can stand before COVID? Yes, we got some stuff we got to face, but look at what verse three says. Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you so you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. So God began to speak to the people and he began to let them know you're going to face some tough stuff. Oh, but by the way, let me throw this in. I'm going in front of you. I'm going ahead of you and I'm a consuming fire and I'm going to burn up everything that gets in your way. So all you got to do is come and pick up the spoils because I'm going to make sure you win. Now here, here's the thing. That was the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, they didn't have the relationship with God that we have in the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Old Covenant. The New Testament is the New Covenant. In the Old Testament, they had to go through somebody to get to God. In other words, if Brother Tommy was the priest, I couldn't talk to God. I had to talk to Tommy so Tommy could talk to God for me. But here in the new covenant, I don't need Tommy to talk to God. I can wake up, and excuse my terminology, I can wake up in my drawers and still talk to God. I don't need somebody to go before me. And so here's the great thing. No longer is God going before me and being the consuming fire. God made me a consuming fire because God put his spirit down on the inside of me. And the first verse I read said, John will baptize with water, but there's coming somebody that's going to baptize with the spirit and with fire. So when I walk out in the world, it don't look like it because things don't turn around right away. But when I walk out in the world, I'm burning some stuff up. And you better connect to me. And you better love me. And you better walk with me. Because when I step in the earth, things are burning up around me. Because God is working through me. God is for me. God is by me. God is beside me. But God is in me. Where can I? Just last Sunday, as we left the church, uh, I, I, was, I was driving in. I passed Washington, seeing everything was blocked off on Washington. And I said, oh, yeah, I want to go to the Washington Street Festival. That's something I did when I was young. And my boys was like, what is that? And they don't know what it was. And I was like, yeah, come on, go. And Drayton was like, I don't want to go. I was like, come on and go. Whether you like it or not, we're going to walk into Washington Street Festival. So, so we were there. We bought a, a little thing. And then the last thing, right before we were going to leave, we sat down at this table and we were eating an elephant ear, getting ready to, to go. And in about two minutes, somebody collapses next to us, just on the right side of us. They collapse and fall out. And everybody said, go get the paramedics. And, 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 and listen, I didn't run over there to give them CPR. I didn't do anything, but I stood where I was and I immediately began to pray. And it just dawned on me. That's why you stopped at the Washington Street Festival. And that's why you sat right where you sat, right before you were getting ready to leave because I knew what the devil was going to try to do to that man and the man passed out and before the paramedics could even get there, before they could even call 911, he opens his eyes and he says, I'm okay. And everybody says, no, no, stay right there. He said, no, I'm okay. And he gets up on his own and sits back down and God told me, that's why you were there because you are consuming fire. We won't know till we get to heaven. Everybody that was blessed just because they were connected to us because God uses us as a conduit to work through us to touch the world. So don't you let the devil lie to you. 
Don't you let the devil tell you you're no good. You've got a fire burning inside of you. And yes, it's hard to live this life, but guess what? The reward is going to be amazing. There's some family members that don't like you. They don't know that they're living because of you. They talk about you, but they don't know the only reason why breath is still in their body is because God is using you to burn up stuff around. And if you live long enough, someone will come back and say, I'm sorry for what I said. And if they don't say, I'm sorry, they'll just start treating you different. I remember I had somebody close to me steal some money from me, and I knew they stole some money from me. And, and it wasn't no chump change. It was a lot of money, but... But God didn't allow me to do a thing. It took a while for me to forgive. I didn't forgive right away overnight. It took me a while, Brother Tommy. But later on in life, that same person, they never said I'm sorry, but they just start giving to me. They just start blessing me here and there. And God knows how to make your enemies your footstool. He knows how to turn stuff all the way around. You just don't let your fire go out. God will repay everything. Amen. Scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. All right, C, point C. This is our third point, C, your prayer. So he's after your zeal or your passion. He's after your message. But at the end of the day, in your message is your prayer life. So he's after the effectiveness of your prayer, not just the effectiveness of your prayer. He's trying to get you so low down, so bogged down that you can't even pray. You don't even want to pray. We folk talk about praying, you get irritated. Just, no, forget that. God ain't hear me. That's what the devil wants you to believe because he wants to shut your mouth. Because in your mouth comes your zeal, comes your message, but it comes your prayer. Let's, let, let's, uh, let, let, let me say this just real quick before we go, go into this, the scripture. What's powerful about prayer, we used to think that prayer had to be done in a certain way. That you had to be on your knees. You had to be at a prayer meeting. But we learn when you have God in the fire inside of you, you can walk and pray. You can drive and pray. Please don't bow your head and close your eyes while you're driving. No, baby, keep your eyes wide open, but you can pray with your eyes wide open. When I was sitting beside the man eating my elephant ear, I, I, I didn't get on my knees and say, oh, Father, God, help. No, I was just sitting there, and God was doing his work. And when something happened, immediately I began to go into prayer. God fix, God help, God touch. When I'm driving on the road and there's an accident on the other side of me, I don't have time to stop and turn around, but I say, God fix, God save, God deliver. Listen, your prayer is important. Your prayer is powerful. And if you don't have your fire, your prayer is weak. So the devil don't want you praying because you mess up his plans. I like to say it this way and sometimes we, we don't think of it this way but Satan is not omnipresent like God so he can't be everywhere at the same time. So what Satan has to do, he has to use his company of demons and demonic forces. Now demons don't die so they've been around here for a long time. They are much older than us. So many times Demons have been strategically set up to do stuff to you. They've been waiting 30, 40 years. They've been putting stuff together. Your, 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 your sister, sister's sister, your, I mean, your sister's grandmother and great-grandmother, all of them was molested. Your sister was molested, but when it came to you, somehow it missed you because something got in between. And what that does, that messes up all Satan's plan. He had been planning for years to take you out, but you messed up and came to Deliverance Temple. And somehow you got delivered out of everything Satan was trying to do. And that's why God, he don't want us praying. He don't want us doing anything because we mess up years of plans that he's planned. There's demons waiting. There have been demons trying to kill you when you got in the car, but somehow they couldn't do it because the angels of the Lord protected you. You done text while you was driving. You done ate while you was driving. You put on makeup while you was driving, and somehow you still made it to your destination. You fell asleep while you was driving, and the devil sure enough knew you was going to die, but somehow God stepped in and worked it out because somebody was praying for you. So what Satan hates, he hates a praying church. Because you mess up his plans. Let's look at 1 Kings 18, 24. Not going to give the entirety of the story. Just going to call 
to you or remember something that happened with Elijah. First Kings 18, 24 says, and you call upon the name of your God, and I'll call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Just to give you the background, that, that people were worshiping the Baals, and Elijah said, God is the only true God, and so he decided to have a squaring off with all the prophets of Baal and just himself. I believe it was 400 prophets of Baal and just himself. He said, we're going to create a sacrifice. You pray to your God, I'm going to pray to my God. The God that answered by fire, let him be the real God. And if you know the story, they cried out, they cut themselves, they hollered, but their God didn't do a thing because their God was lifeless. He was nothing. But when Elijah called on the name of his God, he came down and answered by fire. And what I'm trying to let you know, that fire lives on the inside of you because you know the true and the living God. And when you speak and you speak prophetically in prayer, you call the fire of God to fall. To back that up, let's go to 2 Chronicles uh, 7. This backs it up and, and it will, we'll go to a, a very familiar scripture, but we want, I want to start at the beginning of the chapter. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord Feel the temple. The moment Solomon got done praying, and it, here's the connotation or the context behind that, is that, that what was going on is that uh, they had created the temple for God. Uh, God had stayed in a tent, and they actually made a temple. And so they brought a lot of sacrifices. And Solomon began to pray in that temple, and God answered by fire. I need you to understand, see, that's the Old Testament. In this time, God doesn't answer by fire. Because if he did, the carpet would be burned up, the chairs would be burned up. We can't go online. So you don't see the fire like they saw the fire. But I don't want you not to believe that the fire is still here. When you praise, the fire falls. When you pray, the fire falls. When you give, the fire falls. You may not see the fire, but I guarantee you them demons see the fire. And one place the fire falls, it falls on us. Because it burns up the sacrifice. And right now, we are the living sacrifice. And sometimes when we're ready to quit up, what burns is the quit in us. Sometimes the quit in you burns. The complaining in you burns. The, the, all the backsliding, the falling back burns. Because when you begin to pray and you begin to connect with God and, God and people begin to pray for you. And right now, we have started up our 24-hour prayer again. The fire falls down. Let's look at Verse 11, dropping down to verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Guess what? The fire helps you with the things that you are planning to do. It burns up the obstacles. Yes, the obstacles show up, but the fire ultimately burns up everything between you and success. You just got to hold on and not lose your fire. Let's look at verse 12. This is going to bring us up to a very familiar verse. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Remember, this is Old Testament. It was a literal temple. They went from a tent. And what we mean by tent, they had to pick up the tent everywhere they went and they had to change. But once they got in Jerusalem, they actually built a temple that people can come in like deliverance temple it was it was bigger than this but a place where people can come but that was the old testament in the new testament we become the temple the church is not the building we are the church the building is a place where the church comes to gather so in the new testament we are the temple so what God is saying, where the fire is going to fall, it's going to fall on the inside of us because we are the temple. And that's why we didn't fail when the pandemic came and we shut the church down the first time. And just last 
this month at the beginning when we shut the church down for the last three weeks because the building is not the church. Yes, this is the place we come, but this ain't really Deliverance Temple. You are Deliverance Temple, and I am Deliverance Temple, and Sharitha is Deliverance Temple, and the folk online is in Deliverance Temple, and there's some folk that are part of us that don't even live in Indiana, in California, and in South Carolina. They are Deliverance Temple, and wherever we come together, the fire falls. Because he said, I've chosen this place. All right, let's look at verse 13. Now he turns a corner. That's going to get us to the familiar passage of scripture, and you'll probably catch it while I go there. He makes this statement. I got to give you just a little teaching lesson after I read it. It says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. So, God told Solomon, this is the place that I'm going to allow my presence to fall. But then he makes this statement. If I begin to cause trouble to hit the land. Now, I need to give you this quick teaching lesson. In the Hebrew, there is no such thing as the permissive tense. What that means is they had no word for allow and had no word for permit. So when the Hebrew was translated into the English, everything God allowed, the scripture says God caused because they didn't have a way in Hebrew to say he permitted or he allowed. So here's the context. God did not cause COVID. God did not send COVID. God didn't create COVID because where would he create it for? There is no sickness in heaven. There is no sickness in him. So he didn't create it, but he is God. Sometimes he allows it. And many times the reason why he allows it is because his people are out of alignment with him. They've lost their focus and they lost their fight and they've lost their footing and they've lost the, their fire and the devil is getting the best of the entire world. So when things are going wrong in the world, stop blaming the world and start blaming the church. See, in America, slavery never could have happened if the church would have rose up. But some churches did, especially the Quaker church. They, they were part of the Underground Railroad. But by and large, the reason why racism has been so long in America, because the church wouldn't do their job. So God has to step back and allow stuff because he can't go against his word. And his word says do justice and do mercy. And when you don't do justice and you don't do mercy, curses will come on the land. He didn't send the curse, but he has to allow the curse because what can he do? He's got to stand by his word. So here, I'm going to read verse 13 again. And then we'll go to 14, and you'll understand why I went this way. It says, when I shut up the heavens, or let me read it the way it, it could be if there was a permissive tense. When I allow the heavens to be shut up, which means famine, so that there is no rain, or I allow the locusts to come and devour, or I allow the demons to get in your son to cause him to end up in prison. Or I allow the devil to come into your marriage and mess stuff up. Or I allow things to devour the land and I allow pestilence to come among my people. We're not talking about among the wicked folk. We're talking about when the church folk go through stuff. When I allow those things, I didn't cause them, but why did I permit them? Because I'm trying to get your attention. Because you, you, you done lost your fire. So I'm trying to get your attention. But then he makes this statement here in verse 14. And this is where it's very familiar passage. Verse 14 says this. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin. But here's the context. And heal their land. So the land will be healed if my people would do what they're supposed to do. So yes, COVID hit the entire globe. But don't blame the globe. Blame the church. And here comes another variant. Don't blame the globe. Blame the church. Because in the new variant, I've seen preachers talking about uh, 
Don't you wear a mask. One, one preacher got up and said, don't you wear a mask in my church. I'll kick you out. What kind of wisdom is that? Because we believe and we trust God. But that don't mean you got to be foolish. So God's trying to get the, the attention of the church because a lot of people believe it's okay if the world goes to he hell in the hands basket as long as my few and my few mates go to heaven. That ain't the plan of God. God says go to the highways and the byways and compel men to come. So when the world is suffering, it's time for us to raise up. And he said if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, get out for your prideful self and start Start having a heart for the world. Don't just look at CNN so you can say, oh, everything is bad. Look at CNN so you can allow the fire inside of you and begin to pray over things. They tell us that Indianapolis is almost as bad as Chicago with the deaths and the murders. Well, what are we doing in Muncie to pray about it? We can't just come to church and not do anything. Open your mouth and pray for the entire world because the fire lives inside of you. He said, he said, first thing I'll do, first thing I want you to, I want you to turn from your wicked ways. But he said, first thing I'll do, I'll forgive your sin. Don't worry about your wicked ways. I do need you to turn from them. I don't want you to be being wicked and then trying to pray to me. No, no, I need you to turn from your wicked ways. But guess what? I'll forgive your sin. And here's the thing that the folk out there don't know. They don't know God will forgive their sin. So they stay in their sin. We know God will forgive our sin. So why do we stay in the sin? Why, why don't we rise up to the challenge? I think the pandemic was allowed to wake up the church to get on your job. I, I, I don't have a lot of time to do this, but let me fuss for just about three seconds. You got Christians who won't read the Bible. You have Christians who won't pray. You have Christians who won't even listen to worship music unless they're inside the church. Well, I prayed on Sunday. But did you fight a devil on Monday? Well, you need to pray on Monday too. And so God is saying, I had to permit it to wake y'all up because before I come back, he said, I'm coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And if y'all are all jacked up, how could I ever come back? When you coming back, God, when you coming back? God's like, when you going to get right? When you going to get right? When you going to allow the fire to rise inside of you? Because you, we are working together. I told you to pray, my kingdom come, my will be done. I told you to pray that. I told you that whatever you bind on earth is bound like it's bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose like it's loosed in heaven. So stop, stop rubbing your, your, your lips and going around with a pity party and get on your post and get on your job and call heaven down for this world. Don't wait till you're in a crisis to call it down. Verse 15. And then God makes this statement. He said, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna try to speak loud because I'm gonna put the mic down. I'm gonna give you just an example. Basically, God was saying, because my people weren't praying, this is what I had to do. I had to close my eyes and put my fingers in my ear. Because my folk were just so wicked. He said, but if, if y'all would turn and start praying, my eyes can open up. Because I, I don't want to keep looking at the wickedness of my people. My eyes will open up and my ears will be unstopped and I will hear the prayers of my people. Verse 16 For now I have chosen and consecrated this house. What house? Your own temple. That my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Reva, God says, I want my spirit to be in you forever and ever and ever. And I can call, it's, it's a few of us in here, so I can call all y'all name out, but I won't because I, I, I want y'all to, to be able to get out on a good time. But let me just say one, one more. Sister Francis, God says, I want my spirit in you forever. Eternity belongs to you. So I, I, I open my eyes because you are giving me what I need and I'm going to use you. To turn things around. We're going to go to James 5.16. And this is how we'll close. So. 
Well, 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 what, Pastor? What if I struggle with wickedness sometimes? Well, join the club. We all struggle sometimes. But here's the answer. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Put the camera on me just for a second. and Let, let me say this as we get ready to, to close. The beautiful thing about being in church, in church, folk are not supposed to judge you for your faults. The horrible thing about church, sometimes that's the worst place to tell somebody about your struggles. Because they'll tell Facebook, they'll tell the whole world, they'll laugh at you and dog you out. But please don't make deliverance that deliverance temple that type of uh, church. Because guess what? I will not be your pastor. I will walk off the job and do something else. I want our church to be a hospital where people can he be healed. If you tell me I'm struggling, I want you to know I'm going to pray with you. I ain't even got to tell the pastor what you're going through. Me and you going to walk through this together. I know you're struggling, but I don't want you to struggle by yourself. I'm going to grab my hand with you. I know you're addicted, but I'm not giving up on you. I'm going to check on you. And before you fall, call me. Before before you get tempted, call me. I'll do life with you. I'm your pew mate. I'm your chair mate. We are Deliverance Temple. We are the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when you're down, I'll call fire down. But when I'm down, I need you to call fire down. We need to work together. And if we confess our faults one to another, and guess what? That's why I get the mic and tell you my troubles. That way, you don't think I'm super special. Listen, I need help just like y'all need help. We're in this too. Together. But look at what the, the rest of the verse says. I'll read the entirety of the verse and then we'll close. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins. The King James says, confess your faults to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The King James says it this way. And the reason why I went to it, the King James says, the Effectual, fervent, or hot prayer makes things happen. I'm paraphrasing. The Amplified says it makes tremendous power available. So the reason why we confess our faults one to another, so you know that when God moved, it wasn't because of Andre. It wasn't because of Darlene. It wasn't because of Essence. But it was because of the fire. Or the God inside of Andre. The fire or the God inside of Darlene. The fire or the God inside of Essence. It's not our flesh, but it's the God that lives in us. And when we do that, power is made available. And the world is benefited because you pray. Your neighborhood is benefited because you pray. Your family is benefited because you pray. Your children are benefited because you pray. Your job is blessed because you pray. Satan wants to get your zeal or your passion. He wants to get your message and shut your mouth. But ultimately, he wants to shut down your prayer. But guess what? We're not going to lose our fire because there's power in our prayer. Fervent, hot, fireful power in our prayer. Come on, let's put our hands together. Don't lose your fire. Don't lose your focus, don't lose your fight, don't lose your footing, and don't lose your fire. Because with your fire, the world can be a better place. I know I'm, I'm trying to close, but I ain't seen y'all in a while, so let me, let me just say this. Somebody said, what the world needs now is love, more love. And I'm not here to brag on Deliverance Temple, but you can't get this kind of love in every church. This is a church that will love you to the day you drop and call out your name and pray fire down for you. We don't want to lose anybody because we're communicating Christ's love compassionately. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Come on, you can stand to your feet. Thank you for praising the Lord. Those of you online, we thank you. Thank you for being connected to, to us. We're going to go to our prayer and bow our heads. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, God. We thank you that there is fire in our prayer. We thank you that Muncie, Delaware County is better because of us. We're not the only church, but I'm talking about us right now. Those of us who are connected to Deliverance Temple. And our prayers don't have to be elaborate or deep. Sometimes, like last week, all we got to cry is, Lord, save. 
and Lord help and Lord deliver. And because we are deliverance temple, deliverance will break through in the land. And God, we thank you for the power that we have inside of us. Finally, God, we say it again. We will not lose our focus. We will not lose our fight. We will not lose our footing. And we will not lose our fire for you. Now, God, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus in the pardon of their sins, and they don't have this fire inside of them, I pray that they would say these simple words, God, come into my heart, save me, heal me, cleanse me, wash me whiter than snow, put me on your team, and let me have this same fire that Deliver Simple has in Jesus' name. And God, we pray for the people as they leave this place, never from your presence, protect them, God. And keep them till they can come back again in Jesus' name. And let everybody say amen and amen. God bless you.